So our next speaker is uh, Martin Jetski, and the stage is yours, Martin. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming to my talk. Uh, before I start, uh, let me just spend uh, maybe a minute or two about myself, who am I? So I, if you, in case you don't know me at all, I, I have been a passionate programmer since I can remember and I have a special inclination towards, uh, let's say, system level stuff and microkernels. I have also been working on the Helen OS microkernel multi-server project since uh, 2004. Uh, but uh, this talk won't be about Helen OS this, this year. Uh, I also changed uh, roles quite recently, so I have spent more than 10 years in academia. And last year I decided that I, I should also look uh, on the operating system development landscape in uh, industry. So I switched to Huawei Technologies. You might probably know Huawei as a producer of smartphones. Some of you might uh, know Huawei uh, as a... Uh, supplier to telco operators and uh, enterprise companies uh, but we also we are a large company so we have also our own microkernel partially formally verified we have also a unikernel uh, actually two of them but i won't be talking about this either because these are cl uh, closer software so far uh, so maybe another time so what i'm going to talk about actually uh, if you don't know uh, the keywords or buzzwords or how, however you would call them from the title of the talk. So this is the primary motivation of my talk, uh, something called memory barrier. Uh, probably you have noticed that the issue of current computer hardware or architectures, at least since uh, the beginning of 1980s, is that the relative speed of uh, the CPU grows much faster than the relative speed of memory. This, this, this graph shows this uh, comparison uh, up to 2005, but uh, believe me, there has, there has been no positive change with regard to this. So basically, we have very fast, powerful CPUs which are being starved uh, from data. The, the memory RAM and, of course, also persistent memory is uh, not able to keep track performance-wise. Uh, there is a textbook example and one way how to solve this problem, uh, and those are caches. Of course, our CPUs currently have a multitude layers of caches that tries to mitigate this problem some, somehow to, to make the CPU be, uh, to, to allow the CPU to run at its top speed by caching the data that it needs to use. And of course, uh, this needs to be taken into account. So this is, a, like I have said, a textbook, <laughs> textbook example. Imagine you have a comparison of two sorting algorithms. One is classical quicksort, which uh, is a comparison sorting algorithm. So it runs at big O, n times log n, uh, with where the n is the number of elements you are sorting. And if you know something about your elements, uh, you can use uh, very special sorting algorithms like Redix sort, which can run in linear time. So you implement it, you benchmark it, and uh, the first benchmark is quite reasonable. So you, depending on the number of elements you are sorting, you, you count the number of instructions per item. And you get what you expect, the, the, the quick sort, uh, is initially slower, but uh, uh, you know has a, has a lower number, or, uh, has a uh, has a lower number of uh, instructions per item. But uh, uh, then, of course, the relic sword wins because it's a linear algorithm. So nothing so much surprising that that's what you expect from the theoretical computational complexity. However. If you have just a straightforward implementation of these algorithms, you might get into this. So you are now not comparing the number of instructions, but the actual number of CPU cycles that needs to be taken per, per one element uh, by, the, by the implementation of the algorithm. And suddenly, this is a totally different picture. So suddenly, the linear algorithm is not winning uh, for some reason. Uh, so 
of course, there is some, not only some, some additive uh, constant which is hidden by the big O notation, but also some, obviously, some multiplicative constant that is still beating, uh, beating, uh, so where the quicksort is surprisingly still beating the radix sort. And if you dig even deeper, of course, you can, you can read uh, uh, this uh, textbook example yourself, you can find out that the issue is precisely the incorrect or inefficient use of the caches. So the way how you would uh, no normally, in a very straightforward way, straightforward way, implement those two algorithms makes the quicksort much more cache friendly than the radix sort. So although radix sort should beat quicksort, it probably won't because you don't uh, use the spatial and temporal locality of the data you are accessing properly. Uh, thus, uh, the caches cannot help you. Thus, you, you have to end up reading from, from the memory. And the memory barrier I have uh, spoken about in the, beginning, in, in the beginning kills you. So of course, one way to do it is to implement your algorithm in a cache-aware way and uh, make it cache-friendly. OK, I will stop here. I, I could obviously talk about this topic for, for hours, but let's switch to something different. Just, just one small observation that, uh, that you should uh, take home, if nothing else, from this talk. Of course, uh, we usually consider accessing memory as a constant operation, as an operation with constant complexity. But it's, so it's true that uh, random access to the memory takes a constant time of operations, one, uh, but uh, it does not necessarily take one co or a constant number of time units, precisely because of, you have, because of this, uh, uh, this caching effects which can, can make your algorithm running 10 or, or 100 times slower if you don't fit into the cache. So this is, this is not true. Actually, what you should consider is that the the memory access into today's RAM is uh, something like big O square root of n, where dn is the size of your data or your working set. So generally speaking, the more data your algorithm is working with, the slower it will be. Obviously, because you, don't, you cannot fit all the data into your fast, quick caches, you have to access the RAM. And uh, there are some ways or proposed ways how to break this memory barrier, how to get rid of this, uh, this uh, troublesome issue. Because, of course, it is troublesome. It, it violates our primary assumption that accessing a random piece of memory should, be, should take always the same constant time. And uh, one of them is uh, somehow rethinking the entire hardware architecture of our machines. Of course, uh, if I show you this basic picture of the von Neumann architecture, uh, it's not completely fitting. We have m more complex machines than they, they were built and designed in 1940s. We have more CPUs, not just one CPU. Our <laughs> peripherals are usually combined. They are not strictly input and output. They can be input, output, and, and so on. But generally speaking, our machines are still von Neumann. So there is this clear separation between memory, between a computing unit that does some calculations with the data, and between, let's say, persistent peripherals that store the data persistently. And this could be changed. So for example, you might have heard about some new emerging memory technologies that try to solve the problem of, uh, of uh, the memory barrier I have spoken, so that they, they strive to be as fast as we can make the CPUs. And uh, uh, ideally also combine the split between the persistent and non-persistent, or volatile, non-volatile memory. So t to have a persistent memory that would be as fast as uh, the CPUs. That would obviously solve all our problems. Uh, it, it would also reshape the, the way how our software is being built. So if you have heard about projects like the machine from HP, or if you would listen to the parallel talk that is currently running by Lime 
proven. Uh, he might uh, he might tell you some historical perspective to to this different computer architectures, uh, with basically with single level memory or universal memory. I have listed some of the of the currently being developed technologies that try to try to make this work. Uh, again, as you can see, probably by looking on your smartphone, or smartphones by looking on your laptops, we don't have these technologies in them yet. So they are promising. They might they might help all our problems uh, in the near future, future. Let's hope, but they are not doing it yet. So I won't be talking about this either. So let me switch the topic for the third time, and uh, let me speak about, uh, let's say, uh, more evolutionary, less radical solutions to, to the problem of, uh, of uh, the memory barrier. And this is uh, called near data processing. So reshaping the architecture of the computers uh, by moving the computations or some parts of the computations closer to where the data actually is. So for example, uh, moving the computation partially to the memory or to the storage. Of course, again, this is not a completely new idea. That's why this is an evolutionary, not a revolutionary approach. Because partial locality, uh, sorry, spatial locality of data uh, is something that we have been using in all the other approaches for a long time. And for example, GPUs are basically doing the same for the past 15 years. So, so you are having very specialized circuitry, very specialized processors that uh, work on the data Close, stored close to them, and not having, not not uh, bearing the, the the primary CPU, the general CPU with uh, with these tasks. So it's about breaking the monopoly of the of the primary CPU on working on the data. Our CPUs are fast, but they are also power hungry. So if you can have a dedicated circuitry that that, that can uh, solve part part of the problem, part of the data processing <laughs> problem. Uh, closer to the data, you can save on, on performance, and you can potentially also save on the energy, because you, don't have, you, you have less data to move around the machine. L this uh, has been shown to be true. I mean, I'm, I'm really not just, just inventing this stuff. You can read academic publications from, from people, uh, from uh, Samsung, for example, and others. Uh, who really show that uh, this near data processing approach can work in specific cases. So for example, this is one paper that shows the near data processing on, on, uh, on SSD storages or SSD controllers, where you can really uh, offload part of, let's say, database queries or big data queries onto the SSD controller itself and it will per perform better. Im immediately, you can say, OK, this might not work in all cases. Of course not. I mean, it won't work in case uh, where the data processing is uh, computational heavy, uh, computationally heavy. In that case, the, the poor ARM cores that are on the controllers cannot possibly beat the, the beefy CPU, multi-core CPU, which you have in the center of, of your computer architecture. But think about a different scenario. Think about when your CPU is currently already under load. So it's loaded to 90% or whatever. Then that little help, that little push that you can get from the, from the, from, from the embedded cores in the controllers, although they are not so fast, can still help you. Think, think about them as coprocessors, as a, an additional computational units that, that, will get, uh, that might get you uh, more of uh, computational power. So that, that really works. And about the other, other benefits, the energy consumption, yes, this also has been shown to help. Because again, depending on the scenario, you can just uh, save the actual energy, I mean, I mean in, 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 in watts that, uh, uh, that you spend. Uh, when pre-computing something or pre-filtering something close to the data compared to the usual case where you just uh, blindly move the data to the, to the power-hungry, beefy primary CPU where 
half of the data will be thrown, aw thrown away anyway, or maybe even more. So, of course, this is very important. It, it's 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 this scenario specific or workload specific, and the the best way or the best case where this really works is when you have a large filtering ratio or large selectivity. So you you save on moving the data that you would filter out anyway, or where you can do some some let's say very basic pre-computations that might help you for the more heavy ones. And these are where the two branches of near data processing basically work. So uh, first is uh, the near data processing in memory, so really on, on the DRAM chips, uh, where, of course, this is the problem we have started with in the beginning. So the DRAM is, is slower than, than, uh, than the, the CPUs. It, the, the circuitry cannot be uh, created to operate uh, on such a speed as the CPUs, uh, CPUs do. And if you would be able to do it, or if you, if you are able to do it like using static RAM, then it's much more complex and costly. But, but the DRAM chips have still a lot of parallelism in them. So imagine a regular uh, DIM uh, which you put into, into your machines. It has multiple, multiple chips. These multiple chips have uh, uh, independent uh, memory matrices in them. This is a crude picture how, how the DRAM might, might uh, work. So each time you need to access some word in, in this memory, the DRAM controller has to program the, the memory matrix to fetch a relatively long hardware words, maybe 256 bits, so maybe even, even larger, and then you have to pre-filter or filter the, the smaller units that you are actually trying to access. And of course, even with the current caching approaches, you do some optimizations, like you usually uh, you are not interested in, in individual words, but you are interested in entire cache lines, so that, that helps you uh, pre-populating the cache. You might do some prefetching. You might do things like uh, I don't know, uh, critical word first, which will fetch you the, the the bits that you are really interested in, and then prefetch the rest of the of the hardware word to the cache and so on. But I mean, you can go further. You can imagine that since you have this uh, this uh, level of of possible parallelism there, you can you can extend this uh, this gating logic to do some simple bitwise filtering, so removing the data which uh, do not uh, follow the pattern you are interested in, or making some very crude bitwise computations. So this won't slow it in any way, and again, it might save you from moving the data that you would throw away uh, later on still. So this is one thing, uh, uh, one branch of near data processing. Uh, I'm currently not working on this because uh, Huawei, unfortunately, does not produce its DRAM chips, so we have we are limi limited here. But uh, I do work on the other branch, which is in storage processing. So applying very similar principles on on the, the persistent memory, on on SSD chips, on flash memory, uh, where you have. Uh, I mean, y you can use the same principle. You can, you can benefit from the fact that that you can y you have uh, several flash chips that you can access in parallel. Uh, these chips themselves have a possibility to do to do uh, another, let's say, level of parallelism due to the to the uh, to the independent channels and ways they they provide, and also the SSD controllers do have more computational power inherently than, than the DRAM chips because you already need some computational power there from, from the beginning. You have to do some, some uh, uh, flash layer translation. You have a sorry, flash, flash translation layer. You have to do the garbage collecting due to the way how the flash memory works. So you have to do wear leveling. So, so it's not, not uh, surprising to have uh, on, on a, let's say, above consumer slightly uh, on the border between consumer and enterprise uh, uh, flash controllers, let's say an eight core ARM uh, 
CPU. So this already provides you with more possibilities than doing ju just very simple static filtering. And we have uh, our own prototype where we try to test and benchmark these ideas. This should be open sourced probably this year, so you will you will be able to to use it. Anybody will be able to use it. And we, of course, base it on uh, on a different open source project. So this is why I'm going to spend a few minutes talk, talking about this. So if you don't know, there is a, a very nice open source project called OpenSSD, which is basically a GPL implementation of an entire, uh, let's say, real-world SSD controller. So it has two parts. It has a, uh, a specification of the hardware for, for an FPGA Xilinx platform. And you can actually really stick a real NAND chips to it. And it, ha it has everything you would expect, like um, the ONFIN interface and the PCI Express and VME interface for communicating with the host. And it also contains a, a firmware source, which does uh, all the things I have mentioned. So the fl flash transition layer, garbage collecting, and so on. It's very nice project. And we are extending this project to provide uh, some generic near data processing uh, capabilities on top of the NVMe protocol. And we would also like to push it eventually into the NVMe specification. So it wouldn't be like a Huawei vendor specific thing, but it would be a general purpose uh, standard. So what we can do, we can, uh, or what we should be able to do in the course of this year is to offload some data processing code to, to the controller, uh, possibly using some safe bytecode, because of course, uh, when we are speaking about offloading some code somewhere, we always have to think about the potential security threats and issues. So we don't take this lightly. Uh, this is connected to the to the data sets. So uh, imagine that you might have multiple tenants, multiple independent users accessing the data. Then you don't want them to trip trip on their their shoes. So you want to be able to isolate them as the as the kernel would isolate them in case of, of a normal data access. And then we have the NDP read and write commands, uh, which are equivalent to the usual read and write commands, but with this additional data processing. So, filter, so it, it could potentially do filtering uh, or some aggregation or maybe other things. Uh, the computational model we are currently using is flow-based, so of course we don't want to have really arbitrary execution on, on the controller, calling some syscalls, whatever, that would not make much sense. It should be really tied to what this is supposed to do, so do some data processing. And we are adding a totally new NVMe command for transforming the data. So in, in the most simplest case, you can think about it as uh, uh, data copying without going through, uh, without sending the data to the host and back. So currently, if, if, uh, the, if you have any NVMe uh, flash controller or SSD controller, and you would like to implement something like, uh, I don't know, copy on write on, on file systems like ButterFS or ZFS, you unfortunately, you have to really really uh, for the metadata read the uh, read the metadata from from the device and send it back to some other addresses this this might save you the round trip so even for this simple case this might be beneficial okay so uh, we also we w we would certainly like to demonstrate this not just on toy examples but on some real life scenario so we are currently working on a on a custom uh, storage engine for MySQL that would make use of this by means of doing operator pushdowns. So really, that would you expect if you have an SQL query like select something where something that where part should be at least partially pushed down or floated to the storage, and maybe maybe some other other uh, scenarios. We also have a, just like as a side note, uh, 
uh, created an emulator in QEMU for basically it's it's a interesting setup where you have one QEMU running the the ARM firmware of the SSD controller, another QEMU where you have uh, the the host like usual x86 uh, virtual machine, and you connect those two so that you can independently verify your extensions. Of course, this cannot be used for benchmarking purposes. This is just for speeding up the development because uh, all those Xilinx tools are interesting. They are not open source, and we are really dedicated to the open approach. So, of course, evaluating performance-wise would need to be done on the, on the actual hardware, but uh, uh, for especially for people to be able to poke into this, uh, having a QMU model would be nice. Okay, so how do microkernels fit into this? Because we are in the microkernel dev room and I have hardly mentioned them. I think this is just uh, the first step. Uh, this really calls for, for a totally different approach to programming our machines. Currently, I would describe the approach as uh, computational cent computationally centric. So we have still this, this central CPU that does most of the heavy lifting, and we just offload from time to time something else to some offloading units, be it a GPU, SSD, in memory, uh, smart memory, whatever. But uh, we can really go further, we can really start thinking about our machines as massively distributed systems again. And not only uh, distributed across the network, but also uh, thinking about them uh, as, a, as a combination of multiple heterogeneous computational units within the box you have. So not just a central CPU and some, some peripherals around it, but uh, thinking about it as a combination of different dif CPUs, possibly with different instruction set architectures with different, uh, different ways how they operate, but processing the data, running your programs, your applications in combination. And there, goes, there go microkernels. I mean, microkernels are ideal for this because microkernels on one side create a very simple, lean interface for, for the applications. Basically, just memory management, scheduling, and IPC. And the IPC part is also important because it creates uh, an abstract and at the same time well-defined interface for creating systems like uh, Norman basically showed in the previous lecture for crea creating complex systems built out of fine-grained components. Uh, and yeah, th this is why I like multi-server uh, microkernels. Hopefully, many of you do also. But this can be simply extended. I mean, why thinking about uh, just a single CPU running a single microkernel and a single composition of components on top of it? Why not think about this as a, as a distributed system? And most of the building blocks will stay the same. I mean. You can run maybe different microkernels, but with uh, Im implementing a very similar API on on the primary CPU, on on some embedded cores in your SSD, in your NIC, in your GPU, and you can just spread the entire system among these uh, different cores while keeping the communication uh, interface the same. Of course, the transport below will be different because it's uh, it's a different thing to send a message from uh, from one CPU to the other, but uh, then, then using shared memory in, in memory coherent system, of course. But in principle, the the API can can cover it. It, it does in many microkernels. I, I mean, Samuel has uh, also said this. Uh, uh, in, in the morning, so the, it's probably very easy in most most microkernels, including GNU Hort, to just extend the communication between the, uh, the between the tasks from uh, from the regular one to communicating over network and going into a distributed system way. 
So yeah, this basically, this slide is just for the people who are reading the slides. So uh, this uh, somehow summarizes what I have just said. So the IPC is the least common denominator and the message passing mechanism can be used to build distributed systems very easily. And final, final point, we as uh, uh, microkernel multi-server developers are used to think in terms of distributed systems, naturally, because we don't build those huge monoliths. We, 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 if, if we do something, uh, we know that we should st stick this small component and glue it to this small com component and stick another small component into it in the middle. And building something complex from Lego bricks. And it's nice. So just s switching the perspective from building, a, let's say, a, a system that runs on a single CPU or, or on a single... Uh, single computational unit to distributed system. It, it's not a far. It's not a big stretch, I would say. Okay, so aren't we actually talking about multi kernels? Yes. Why not? I mean, this approach that that I have coined multi micro kernels could be also implemented by multi kernels. Actually, if you look on Barrelfish or project like that, or, or different similar projects like Barrelfish, they are basically microkernels taken to the extreme. So running a separate kernel on each individual core, even though you have memory coherency between them. So, I mean, this is, this is nothing against the idea I am proposing. What about unikernels? Okay, why not? If you insist on them, I mean, if you, if you imagine that, that you have a, you have a microkernel with a single static workload on top of it, and for some reason you don't care about uh, the isolation between the kernel layer and the user space layer that's basically that's basically a unikernel so it's also covered i mean we are f all friends so what uh, what i propose for myself of course i would be glad if you extend this idea in any direction you choose to to do some initial steps so we are already working uh, on the in storage uh, workload of loading, we might move to, to Nix, uh, maybe next year. And gradually as we implement this, practically to, to measure it, to benchmark it, to, to, to extend it, we might uh, move from our crude runtimes, which we obviously need, to some proto-microkernels. Then gradually to move, we can gradually move to full-fledged microkernels. And the important thing that I'm obviously just skipping, and it's, it's an open problem, how to create some nice frameworks for creating these distributed applications. Because, of course, this is the same issue with uh, concurrency. People usually avoid uh, writing concurrent code because it's conceptually more complex than just writing sequential code, step one, step two, th step three, then a loop, then step four. I mean, th this is simple to grasp. Writing code in a vectorized way is simply more complex to think of. Uh, and with distributed systems, that's the same issue. So, of course, in the end, in the end of the day, what you would like to have and what we would like to have are some very nice frameworks with some very nice abstractions, something like an actor model or, or agent model that would uh, allow the end programmers to, to make use of this machinery in a very simple way, uh, si simple from, from the conceptual point of view. Okay, yeah, so this is something between engineering and, and research. So, of course, there are many open questions. Of course, I in the end of the day, this requires a lot of manpower as, as usual. So, uh, I mean, there is this elephant in, the, in this microkernel dev room every, every year. Why, if we all claim that the microkernels are so great, so why aren't we using them every day, everywhere? Basically, we don't have the manpower to, to push them that far. I mean, th those are not problems uh, of the idea. Those are the problems of the implementation. And we, just, we are just running out of duct tape or the WD-40 
from time to time to time. That's that's the only problem, as at least as I see it. So to sum up, I have shown you uh, first that we have some issues with current current uh, computers. You probably know it. The memory is too slow, uh, or in other words, it's much slower than we would like it to have. Uh, there are some revolutionary approaches how to solve this problem, like implementing a better memory. And there are some evolutionary ways how to solve it, like moving the, some of the computations closer to the data, making use uh, of the fact that the memory might have a big, a large light latency, but uh, inherently it's working in a parallel way. I have shown you by means of reference Microkernels. Uh, I have to thank all my colleagues from our Huawei in storage and DP team because of course this is not just my my work. So feel free to contact them, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you for your attention. No questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Question. Uh, first, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was uh, considering your uh, implementation of the, the MySQL uh, processing yes. engine. Um, the first roadblock or, or hurdle that I would see for that is the, the data localization and data alignment problems between uh, MySQL, which is layered on a file system, is layered on, on a volume manager, is layered on. So how are you uh, planning to, to uh, skip the, the lo data locality Planning to implement an entire storage engine? So the question is, uh, uh, how do we plan to manage all the? Uh, how do we manage the the spatial locality of the data in the case of the MySQL storage engine? We are implementing it. We are implementing, and how do we skip the file system layers and so on bet between the storage and, and the database? So I will start with the end with what I have repeated as the last part. Uh, of course we first uh, implement our storage engine as a block based so we we just avoid f the file system com completely we also avoid uh, the kernel completely I in the first step by by accessing the the nvme ssd controller directly from user space eventually we would obviously need to include at least for some scenarios all these immediate steps so, so we would have to keep the kernel there for arbitration. We would have to have a file system there for ar arbitration. And uh, yes, we are thinking about this. This is exactly why we, we also think about the security, potential security problems and issues from the very beginning. We don't want to somehow stick or glue them afterwards to, to, the, to the finished solution. So basically the, the file system driver in the kernel or in user space, if we are talking about microkernels, would have to instruct the uh, the NVMe driver and, uh, in the end, the, uh, the the SSD controller, which parts of the data belong belong to to individual files, so that the the NDP code running on the controller will will know the boundaries. So that's it. That that's. That's a, that's the solution from the security point of view. Uh, about the performance, yeah, th this uh, of course, basically you are saying that that the file system layout can screw up the benefits we might get. Uh, software hardware co-design, so it, the file system needs to be aware of it. Some some of uh, current file systems are somehow aware of the of the internal or can be made aware about the, the internal configuration of the, of the SSD drive. Uh, we can even think about implementing part of the file system itself 
as the NDP code running on the controller. There are many possible approaches, but we are not there yet, but we are thinking about it. So if that answers your question. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. So the question was, uh, again, related to the security. So how do we handle the fact that uh, the firmware can be buggy, if I understand it correctly? I mean, this, frankly, is out of scope of our work. We, we just, I mean, the, bug, the firmware can be buggy right now. I mean, if, uh, if you look on any real firmware or on any real SSD controller, multitude of things can go wrong it can just access different different parts of the memory if it's implemented incorrectly so so on the very basic level there has to be some some contract some some level of trust between the OS and the firmware of course and uh, once we establish this this base of trust we of, of course need to have some uh, strong assurances that that uh, the 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 operating system or the end user is not offloading something dangerous to 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 the storage, which can be done in uh, at least in two ways. One way is uh, isolation on the hardware level using MMU. Of course, now you are al always thinking about meltdown and Spectre, so yeah, we we assume that this these issues will be eventually fixed by the CPU manufacturers, and con like uh, from. Um, by uh, safety by by uh, by definition so having a byte code or a different way how you offload the data that is inherently safe that could be could be checked statically by some static checker or some static verifier on on the firmware that it really does only what is supposed to be doing that it won't crash the firmware and so on so these are the two components of the security so on your last slide you basically showed uh, Potentially, you have different transports between the different uh, mining tunnels for different CPUs or whatever. And it could even be mixed end of systems. Have you solved this problem, or how do you solve that? So, the question is how do we solve the potential problem of having different transport potentially between different microkernels running on these different uh, nodes of the distributed system? Different yes. So, again, I mean, evolutionary first we we assume that those systems can uh, uh, that they they use or they can negotiate some some common least denominator as as a transport so so i don't know maybe it's uh, l4 protocol or something like that so so it's basically possible uh, if it's not possible or if we really go far into the future where we where, where we think about different communication mechanisms that's uh, uh, again at least could be theoretically solved by some connectors or by some by some adapters that uh, basically adapt the one transport to the other transport think about network bridges i mean yeah they are not popular they are not being used much people try to avoid them as much as possible but if you need to connect to networking technologies which are different you can have a bridge between them that's that's the approach generally speaking if it so if it sat satisfies so the question so the question is whether this would need to be transparent yes ideally yes of course so yeah So the question is, how do we make use of this uh, code of loading uh, uh, on the level of application developers? Well, in, again, when you look on it on from the low low level implementation point of view, uh, you would have to have some some 
small, relatively small, reasonable functions that uh, you would able to somehow cross compile to the bytecode or some to some other form, and uh, you would be able to transport them to to upload them to to the device and then then just run them. Uh, but of course, this is not this is not uh, very satisfactory. So that's w that's the last point I have mentioned. The ideally, there should be some high-level interface, some some high-level abstraction way how to how to do it. So if we think about uh, th this as a data processing problem, there are some paradigms, there are some some computational models such as flow uh, data flow and so on, which could be somehow used to to make it more feasible. But uh, again. Software is complicated. I, I, I mean, uh, if you are if you are uh, implementing a web application, just as an example, uh, you don't really care how how is the is the browser uh, making uh, good use of the GPU to to run your web application faster. So there are layers of software, and different layers have different responsibilities. So you, ideally, the, the, the end programmer should be mostly uh, ob oblivious to it. So thanks again for your attention.